from the superhuman to the supernatural. From dystopian futures to Disney features. Shows. Welcome to our show of shows. It was a very big year for action-packed, effects-heavy movies. And as the race for the Oscars heats up, here's one thing we know. 27 of the last 30 movies to win Best Visual Effects have something in common. What is it? The surprising answer lies at Pixar. To infinity and beyond! Yes, that Pixar. Meet RenderMan, an incredibly powerful software engine that goes well beyond animation. Up until that point, the look, the lighting, essentially had to be done by programmers. Ed Catmull is a co-founder of Pixar, but he started his career at Industrial Light and Magic, George Lucas's famous effects studio. ILM had been trying to find ways to blend live action sequences with visual effects, and Catmull led the computer graphics team, which set in motion the innovations that would become RenderMan. Back then, you actually had to write code to generate effects. So the animations in 1982's Tron, just for one example, had to be produced a frame at a time. An incredible amount of work. Instead of processing an image pixel by pixel, ILM's technology made it possible to render a line at a time and turned a task that used to take days into a matter of hours. And RenderMan dressed that code level magic up in a graphical interface with things like menus and clickable buttons. Not unlike the way Windows demystified personal computing by offering an alternative to the command line. The resulting software allowed artists to realize their creative visions without an extra level of insane technical know-how. The key to figuring this all out was something called the RAISE algorithm. What RAISE stands for is renders everything you ever saw. And we took that pretty seriously. It's a very powerful and very flexible, extensible rendering platform. And boy, did we use it. ILM launched RAISE in 1982's Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. Computer, request security procedure. Well, our initial efforts were to convince people of its value. And it worked. ILM built the simulation of a planet being terraformed. All those effects, flying through digital landscapes, watching the oceans overtake mountains, would have been unthinkable with older methods. There were a lot of things that were striking about that. The particle effects from the impact, you know, this fire that spreads around the planet. Uh, and then as the surface is growing up, uh, those are fractal terrains that are kind of building up um, incrementally as the shot continues. With the power of its rays architecture, ILM also introduced digital motion blur, an effect that's used all the time now to simulate how our eyes see fast motion. In this aerial combat sequence from Return of the Jedi, just a year later, you can see that the motion blur not only conveys a sense of speed, but also helps blend the miniatures into the frame. Here goes nothing. In 1985, they made another big leap forward with the introduction of the stained glass knight, a character that jumped off a window and into real life in the movie Young Sherlock Holmes. I still love the close-up of, uh, of the knight's hands holding the, the sword because there's a rack focus in that. That's the focal effect you see there, where the focus shifts from the knight's hands to his face. And that was rendered into it. So that's you know, one of those amazing capabilities that RenderMan had from the very beginning. And they used the same tools a few years later to make this in James Cameron's movie, The Abyss. It was just this one little scene. But that one scene of the pseudopod pushed the very notion of what digital artists could do by allowing them to give an artificial object virtually any characteristic they could dream of. It's trying to communicate. And they took it even further in James Cameron's next movie, Terminator 2. He decided he would let computer graphics help make a main character in Terminator 2, which was that liquid man. <laughs> You know, the revolutionary thing that we did on T2 with uh, being able to take live action plates and project them onto computer graphics and then distort them. Being able to do that kind of thing in this uh, engine was you know, very enabling for us. Get out. And then in 1993, Jurassic Park came out. 
You know, the original plan on Jurassic Park was that was going to be articulated stop motion puppets. All of that talk went away as soon as we saw the, the first test of a rendered computer generated dinosaur. And because Render Man supported motion blur you know, right out of the box, you could get that uh, very fluid and realistic motion that just, you know, wowed everyone. Once FX artists started getting comfortable with animals and creatures, they started experimenting with humanoid creatures, like Gollum from Lord of the Rings. It was so stunning. Here was this strange creature, and he absolutely looked real. When I saw that with sort of translucent skin, it's like, oh, that's awesome. That translucent skin that made Gollum look so alive when he emerged from the shadows in 2002's The Two Towers utilized a brand new technique, something known as subsurface scattering. Subsurface scattering is a phenomenon that you see in materials that are, are partially translucent. You know, it has a solid surface, but light enters that, that surface, travels some way down into the surface and you know bounces around and uh, and sort of scatters through the surface. Without subsurface scattering, skin looks opaque and inanimate. Simulating what light does below the skin gives it depth and softens the texture, making everything just a little bit more well human. This effect soon became crucial to making CG objects feel natural. Knoll's team used it again to create Davy Jones in the Pirates of the Caribbean series. <laughs> Davy Jones was making kind of extreme use of subsurface scattering. He looks a little bit like a, a jelly bean because of that, but uh, I was really very pleased with the look. Uh, um, and it's, it's the kind of thing that uh, you couldn't have done as a makeup appliance because the, the scattering is so deep. You're a cruel mind, Jack Sparrow. Movie after movie drew on the power of Renderman to realize their ambitions. The X-Men films. 300. There's no reason we can't be civil. Iron Man and the birth of the MCU. Oh, that's my exit. Pixar movies, but we'll get back to them in a second. What's taking them so long? Hey, these guys are professionals. They're the best. And when the Star Wars saga, Lucasfilm's crown jewel, made a comeback in the 2010s, you can probably guess what software artists used to recapture the practical effect glory of the original trilogy. Doesn't sound so bad to me. So in Rogue One, um, like all the travel of spacecraft and uh, you know the, the space battle uh, is computer graphics, um, but we were very deliberately trying to uh, evoke the aesthetics of the original miniatures. One way they did that, using something called path tracing, which simulates how light bounces off objects. It's what makes the space sequences more realistic than you might have even registered. Here's how a laser looked in Return of the Jedi, painted onto the frame. But with path tracing calculating the way the light bounces, the same laser in Rogue One casts an ambient glow onto the X-Wing fighter. And here, path tracing doesn't just account for the shadows of the smaller ships appearing on the larger one below, but it captures the light bouncing off of the larger ship and illuminating the underside of the ships above. You might not notice these things in the moment, but that's the whole point. The light is part of the reality of the frame, not an after effect. The force be with you. And when they wrote Grand Moff Tarkin into the movie, rather than recasting the late Peter Cushing, Renderman made it happen using the same subsurface scattering technique they'd used with Gollum and Davy Jones. When has become now, Director Krennic, the Emperor will tolerate no further delay. While ILM and other VFX houses have been using CG to enhance live action, Pixar has been using Renderman to build its own wondrous animated worlds. It started with their very first film, Toy Story. And it was magic. It was like, it was like there was magic and alchemy happening at night, overnight, on the render farm, uh, creating these images. Lee Unkrich was an editor on Toy Story. Whoa! Toy Story came out in 1995. By then, Renderman had already been used to make the Pseudopod and the T-1000. But all digital animation needs to be rendered, whether it's for a five-second explosion, Rockets explode! or a full-length scene. 
And that's why RenderMan changed the rules for animated films. A full-length movie is a massive amount of information, all of which needs to get rendered out. To infinity and beyond! On the original Toy Story, there was a reason that we made a movie about toys, because back then um, those were easier images to create. Things that were made out of wood, plastic, glass, reflective, um, kind of simple textures we knew how to do really well. Um, what was harder were kind of more organic forms like grass and trees. Just an ordinary blade of grass and a bead of dew, right? Everything was always in the service of the stories that we were trying to create. It was never about, oh, let's, let's make it do this cool new thing. Um, it was never that. It was instead, we've got a movie with monsters and we want some of the monsters to be covered with fur. And we've never done fur before, so how are we going to figure out how to do that in a way that's directable and art directable um, so that we have control over it and can create exactly what we want. Oh, that's cute, yeah. Uh, and then that was the case as well on Finding Nemo with the water, like everything underwater and the look of the water. Um, these were all things that we hadn't tackled before and not many people had. And so it was, it was fun to be groundbreaking through the years. But at the same time, it was always in the service of uh, trying to make great movies, tell great stories. A history of Pixar is a history of watershed moments, but of course, everyone has their favorite. Is there one moment that stands out to you as something that maybe surprised you or, or moved you? The one that actually leaps out at me was we took a, a very major jump from our first film, Toy Story 1. You know, you're in rooms <laughs> and you've got the characters made out of plastic. Don't let it get to you, Woody. Uh, let what? I don't, uh, what do you mean? And then the next one was to go to organic forms. And it still holds up, it's very beautiful. Oh, that's beautiful! <laughs> and then the next one was uh, with Ratatouille. There was a, I think a sensitivity to that. Not everyone can become a great artist, but a great artist can come from anywhere. And a beauty that I just, just uh, astounded me at the time. I will be returning to Gusto soon, hungry for more. While just about every Pixar film used RenderMan to pioneer new techniques and technologies, all of that culminated in the studio's most complex movie to date, 2017's Coco. The music, it's, it's not just in me, it is me. There were very few things that we hadn't done before. It was more a matter of scale. Like we were doing things at a scale that we had never done before. Take the moment when Miguel crosses the Marigold Bridge into the land of the dead. Or that tracking shot through the train station. Whether the lighting or the towers or the hundreds of distinct characters, each sequence is so visually packed that there's no way to catch all the detail. But despite their complexity, they both managed to feel absolutely natural. And that, more than anything, might just be RenderMan's most enduring legacy. Are those renders still overnight processes? How has that changed? Has that yeah, changed? well, the cool thing now is a lot of times uh, the kinds of images that we were creating on the original Toy Story, we can create it almost in real time now. That's huge. That's huge for artists. Because when you're painting a painting, you don't kind of pretend to make brush strokes and then wait, you know, a day for your image to come back. You want to be able to create kind of right away in real time. And uh, we're getting to the point where we can do that. 30 years ago, RenderMan took shape as a tool to help artists bring their imaginations to life. By now, it surpassed those aims and can accomplish those results nearly on demand. But the most mind-blowing visual effect means nothing if it's not in the service of a larger goal. As long as they're impactful and they, they, you know, they do some good in the world, then we're doing our real job. Are you still moved by, by these movies when you see them? Yes. In fact, that's what I'm looking for, is when we're going through this, in the early versions, like at some point, something wells up. I already know roughly what the, 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 the plots and the characters are, but when it starts to get into place, then um, I get emotional or I laugh. Okay, we're, we're getting there. Dream.